They went with songs to the battle. They were young. Straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against the odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning we will remember them. August 1914, Cairns was a small town. Around 10,000 people called it and its district home. Built on the sugarcane industry, this was a town of hardworking, resourceful and practical people. It was a time well before global tourism was even spoken about, before there were thousands of people arriving every day. This was before the war, the First World War. Back then Cairns was remote and the same as today, about as far away from any capital city you could get on the east coast. That also meant that it took time. Time for supplies, time for equipment, time for news. Many Cairns locals weren't aware that what was happening overseas would impact them so soon. On the morning of Tuesday the 4th of August 1914, King George V gave the order that would change history forever. The British government had just declared war on Germany. England called upon their allies to assist with their efforts and Australia was one of those. In 1914, Australia formed the Australian Imperial Force. Since 1912, every male between the ages of 12 and 26 had been required to do compulsory military training but the AIF now looked to the nation for extra numbers. The call went out for fit young men to join up. That call was also heard in Cairns. My name is David Dalziel. My father was Henry Dalziel, VC. He followed his father around, his father and mother who were uh, mining in far north Queensland and in Victoria. We were only enlisted, I think that was through in Ogre Barrack, enlisted in Cairns. Then he was, his first port of call was Egypt and then uh, Gallipoli, where he arrived not in the first wave of, of soldiers but later on. And he was actually part of a, a battalion, the 15th Battalion and he survived a, an enormous Turkish bomb. After the uh, horrible beginning in Gallipoli, they, uh, I think by the time of 1918, when a lot of men who weren't killed already, a lot of men who survived till then on the Western Front, where they were part of the Australian Corps, which was regarded as the best fighting force in, of the whole war. Uh, I think they decided they can't let the Germans win this. I think they 
had a job, they were well trained. It wasn't, it was horrible, but they had a great attitude towards the whole thing. Harry certainly did, and his mates. His award was the Victoria Cross. It was said to be the thousandth BC ever awarded, and the total number of awards was over, uh, I think, 1,300. Um, what he did was, he was one of a pair of men on a Lewis gun, and they, their job, the 15th Battalion, which was his battalion, had the job of capturing Pear Trench near the, near the town of Hamel. On the other side, on his left, I think he said it was, another machine gun opened fire and uh, that was deadly. But Harry decided to pick up his, he said, two revolvers, leave the gun with his mate and dash in and he captured the entire crew. I think he killed a number of them and captured the crew. Um, so that was the beginning of it, but as the battle went on, his Lewis gun and other guns didn't have ammunition, they ran out. So what he did was, by himself, took off over what could have been 500 metres, uh, that would have been there to the ammunition dump and back, uh, and he did that three times, bringing back these 18 kilogram heavy uh, boxes of ammunition. He was awarded the Victoria Cross for that action. Uh, he was hit in the head at the beginning uh, while he continued to bring back these boxes and he kept firing from his gun and a sniper, a German sniper, hit him in the skull, smashed his skull on the left side of the temple and that was it for him, he was finished. He left uh, England in 1919, January I think it was, and eventually after a lot of travelling of course in those days it was trains and coastal steamers, he got back to Atherton 100 years ago this year and it was an enormous welcome. He didn't talk about it a lot, as, as I think most soldiers didn't, uh, because they had these horrific memories there anyway. But he was, I think he was buoyed a lot by the fact that he was awarded the Victoria Cross, and that meant uh, he was fated in a sense, and invited to a lot of places. He was such a man. Uh, he was a, a man, as someone said, who I won't name, that uh, your father was a great man in every sense of the word, certainly from bravery on the battlefront and, you know, lasting through four years and never coming home, not coming home at all until the end. You know, what sort of people would that, what would it take to do that? Um, yeah, and he was everything else uh, other than a war hero. He was a lovely bloke. Throughout the First World War, from a population of just 10,000 people, over 3,000 men from Cairns and the surrounding districts signed up. Initially over 400 men from the Kennedy Regiment and Rifle Club in Cairns went to Thursday Island for training. They were transported via a passenger vessel called the Kanauna. This steamer made regular trips between Melbourne and Cairns and was requisitioned by the military whilst in a stopover in Townsville. It was reported that thousands of people had lined the streets of Cairns to bid the men farewell. They joined over 800 men already on board from Townsville. The men had no idea where they were going. On arriving on Thursday Island, around 500 men signed up for further service outside of Australia. I am Dawn Hartman and I am the second cousin of Ernest Ainscow. enlisted when he was 18 and he was assigned to the 1131st Battalion and he was trained as a signaller. He left Brisbane and arrived in England six months later. Five months after arriving in England he sailed to France. On the 12th of August he received multiple wounds to his arms and legs and died later that day. I was pretty proud to think he was my second cousin. Oh, they did write letters. I know we've got a letter here. Dear all, just a few lines to let you know that I am in the best of health and, and hope you are all, all the same. I started to write to you this afternoon, but we got orders to pack up straight away. So I had to pack up my pad in my kit. We got the order to pack up for overseas. 
but I don't know where we're going. A lot have gone, but I am left to get my shortages with some more lads. We are not allowed to leave the lines until further orders, and I'll write it to you as soon as I get the strength of it. Your loving son, Ernest. Across Australia, the numbers of local men enlisting failed to meet the quota set, so recruitment marches were held throughout the regions in a bid to bolster numbers. In 1916, one such march was held from Bartlefree to Cairns. Over five days, the men walked the 70 kilometres, slowly gathering numbers along the way. The march was called the Cane Beetle's March, in lieu of the Cane Beetle, which was destroying vast amounts of sugarcane at that time. From the initial four men, the march gained support with 29 personnel arriving to fanfare and festivities throughout their trek, culminating in the last post being sounded from the top of the Boland Centre in Cairns. From these 29 men, only two actually served, with the others being classified as medically unfit. While not strong in numbers, it showed the fight and determination that the far north Queensland community stood for. Harry Doyle was a 16-year-old Aboriginal lad from Yarrabah. He lied about his age, saying he was 20, and signed up to join the Australian Light Horse and sail from Sydney in December 1917. In March of 1918, he joined the 11th Light Horse, based in Egypt. The regiment defended the crossing points over Jordan and helped to hold back heavy Turkish and German attacks in July 1918. Harry returned to Cairns after the war where he worked mostly in labouring jobs. He died in 1967, aged 66, and is buried in the Martin Street Cemetery in Cairns. During the First World War, Australia was a relatively new nation. Federation, the process where the individual states agreed to have a federal government, had only just happened in 1901. So the wartime efforts of comradeship and helping one another was truly remarkable. From a population of just under 5 million, 417,000 enlisted. That was 8.5% of the population. And of those 417,000, 62,000 lost their lives and another 156,000 were wounded. And these were just the physical injuries. There is no counting the cost of the emotional and psychological toll. Now these are big numbers and it can be hard to make sense of it all. So let's break it down. 62,000 fatalities over four years is just under 300 killed every week. Let's think about that. On average, every week of that war saw almost 300 young Australians lose their lives. It's staggering to contemplate. Cairns supported their boys abroad with great gusto. Local Red Cross branches were very active throughout this period, collecting donations and providing comforts for the sick and wounded soldiers, both at home and overseas. In 1916, one such fund to raise money to purchase an ambulance for the front reached its goal in only six months. But it was also the little things that really helped lift the morale of the boys. Trench foot was a major health problem caused by their feet always being muddy and wet, so hundreds of pairs of socks were knitted for the troops. Tin food, scarves, pyjamas, mittens and tobacco were all sent on a regular basis. Young boys from the newly established Cairns High School spent thousands of hours making chairs, foot rests and crutches for returning injured soldiers, and many local businesses donated time and transport to deliver these goods. I am Marilyn MacDonald. I'm the great niece of Caleb Shank. Caleb was about 22 when he enlisted and I feel he enlisted because his younger brother had enlisted first, his younger brother Sydney, and he enlisted after him. 
I think that was probably the driving force to start with. Well, he, he went to England first and then was obviously went to France and uh, very heavy fighting. Uh, I know he, um, he was a gunner, but he was mostly, I think, a, a sniper. He was a very, very brave and, you know, sit up in a tree all day waiting um, to, to get the enemy. And then he'd run back cross fight, you know, cross fighting and um, with no thought for himself, he'd just run across battlefields and to get messages across and, and that type of thing. He was a very brave man. Yeah, Caleb got the military medal and then he was awarded the bar to go with it for more bravery. So he's very, he's very brave. He returned in December 1918 and to a welcome of all, just about all of Cairns on, I've heard and read in a report, all of, on the wharf. Um, there was a mayor, I think his mother and his um, sisters that were here, were on the wharf to greet him and he just couldn't work out why all these people were cheering him because they were giving him a hero's welcome and I have read that he was carried on the, carried through the streets um, for his bravery, he, he was awarded he was, um, yeah, hero, a major hero out of him basically. Carried him through the streets and he was sort of a bit, I think, confused as to why they were making such a fuss of him because I think it was just his way that he was, um, yeah, it's just what he wanted to do and, and did a very good job of it while he was away. So um, probably couldn't work out why the um, big fuss was being made. I think it did make Carl a stronger person because he tried to enlist again in the Second World War. Um, so obviously he made him a very strong person who wanted to keep to go and, you know, to keep us all safe. And um, he tried to get into the armed forces again and he, and he was knocked back, of course, he's getting older and not well. But he really obviously made him a much stronger man. I can't get over his bravery, his absolute bravery. The things he did were probably reckless but he did him and he got there. So I am very, very proud of him. Whilst this war may have taken place a hundred years ago, this was not the only conflict that has arisen. This was not the only time when families were ripped apart, that lives were changed forever and Australia and Anzac history created. The future of the memories of these men and women lie with the younger generation. Each year more and more young people are involved in Anzac Day and Remembrance Day commemorations than ever before. Because of the ease of technology, younger generations are understanding what our forefathers went through. The personal struggles for them and their families who are waiting back at home. There is a positive upswing to the memories of our fallen diggers. Younger people want to show their support. They want to let you know they appreciate and they care. They want to let you know they realise that this is a very lucky country and that cannot be taken for granted. Memories are not erased. They are just merely passed on to a new generation. The men and women that so freely gave up their lives to protect our values will always be remembered. They will not be forgotten. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Thinking of people.
never, nor well we had to fight for the Kaiser's funny business. It wants some putting right. Rally round the banner of your country. Take the field with brothers or the form. On land or sea, wherever you be, keep your eye on Germany. But England, home and beauty, have no cause to be. No, no. 